This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. Economic vision. Will President Trump deliver specifics tonight on his pro-business policies? It's what Wall Street's waiting for. Target's troubles last year was tough. This year could be tougher. And now the struggling retailer is doing something risky to win back customers. The discount bin. Investing online just got cheaper. And mom and pop investors are the clear winners. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, February 28th. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sue Herrera. And I'm Bill Griffith in tonight uh, for Tyler Matheson once again. Well, it's over. Uh, the Dow's run of 12 straight record closes has ended. There will be no number 13. Today, a feeling of caution permeated throughout the market. Ahead of the president's first major national address this evening, investors are holding back, waiting to see if he offers policy details. By the close, the Dow average lost 25 points. It finished at 20,812. The Nasdaq fell by 36. The S&P was down six. But for the month, the three major averages posted gains of about three to four percent. The big event for investors comes tonight. President Trump will deliver his first address to a joint session of Congress. His speech is intended to outline his vision for the country. And for investors, that means how he intends to boost the economy and business activity. Kayla Tausche is in Washington with more on what to expect tonight. Kayla, so what are some of the big themes that the president will likely touch on tonight? Well, Sue, as you mentioned, the purpose of tonight is for the president to set the table for the agenda for his administration and its congressional counterparts, which will be tasked with turning much of his agenda into law or putting it on paper. Here's some of the broad strokes that we're expecting to hear tonight. First, expect heavy focus on the economy, the trade deficit, companies that are bringing jobs back to the United States, and incentives for companies that may have yet to do so. Then the conversation will turn toward national security and a White House official today says expect immigration to figure prominently in that part of the speech. Unclear how much detail the president will give about forthcoming policy on immigration with the Wall Street Journal reporting at this hour that potentially a new executive order on immigration could exempt current visa holders. We will see whether the president goes that far, but an official tells me expect the speech to be optimistic yet realistic. We all know, Kayla, the expectations are very high on Wall Street for these initiatives. What about the timing of the ability of the president to get them passed? Well, Bill, beware the Ides of March, as they say. There are multiple legislative priorities and deadlines coming up in the next few weeks. The administration has said expect some tangible ideas on paper about tax reform and about a new replacement for the Affordable Care Act in a matter of weeks. That comes as the White House has a March 16th deadline to turn in a budget blueprint to Congress, and there could be some new skepticism about exactly where the president and the White House want to spend their money. Here's Senator Lindsey Graham on the Hill today. It's a budget proposal yeah. that will probably meet the same fate as Obama's proposals. <laughs> I think President Obama's budget in seven, eight years got one vote. Uh, the bottom line is I appreciate the increase in military spending, but you're undercutting the ability to win the war if you take soft power off the table. Of course, then there is some skepticism on tax reform and whether that could take longer than, pos than originally expected. Congressman Jeb Henserling says it's not going to be a 30 or a 60 day matter, Bill and Sue, but that this Congress might take a full two years to get that done. Kayla, thank you so much. Kayla Tausche for us at the White House this evening. Back to the stock market. The Dow has risen about 2,500 points since the election. And now investors do want to hear some specifics from the president on his pro-growth policies, as we mentioned. What he says tonight could set the tone for trading tomorrow. Bob Pisani takes a look for us now at what investors want to hear and what the reaction might be. Traders are anxiously awaiting President Trump's address to Congress tonight. Now, they want specifics on three issues. First, 
tax cuts, second, infrastructure spending, and third, the timing of the repeal of Obamacare, along with what will replace it. Unfortunately, most traders have come to believe that the speech will be short on specifics and will likely reiterate broad objectives of tax and regulatory reform, infrastructure, trade, immigration, and defense. Now, much of the speech will be directed at a small group, congressional Republicans, many of whom are deeply skeptical that much of the president's plan will result in more deficits and more debt. All of that is anathema to the traditional Republican base. Now, that may indeed happen, but the president has already argued that his great triumvirate of tax cuts and less regulation and infrastructure spending will rev up the economy. So how much will it rev it? Well, GDP growth has been about 2% a year for the last decade. But Trump is arguing his measures could get us back to 3% growth. Now, that would be the long-term average. So far, the trading community has given the president the benefit of the doubt. February is ending with a roughly 4% gain in the S&P 500. You know, that's a great showing, considering that February is historically a down month. But that pass is based on the idea that the president will accomplish his goals and that potential problems, like a trade war, will not materialize. Should traders start doubting those goals, the market will definitely react negatively. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Billionaire investor Wilbur Ross was sworn in as Commerce Secretary. Vice President Pence administered the oath of office a day after Mr. Ross was confirmed by the Senate with Democratic support. And he has a big to-do list ahead of him. The Commerce Secretary is expected to start working on renegotiating trade relationships with both China and Mexico. He will also likely play a role in cutting trade deficits. And many say that he will have a part to play in trying to bring manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. Speaking of which, economic growth slowed in the last three months of 2016. The nation's gross domestic product, which is the broadest measure of all the goods and services produced here in the U.S., grew at a 1.9 percent rate. That was less than the previous report and slightly below expectations. Business investment and government spending were revised downward in the fourth quarter, while consumer spending remained solid. And that solid consumer spending is being reflected in the latest confidence index, which just hit a 15-year high. The conference board's measure gauges both consumers' assessment of current conditions and also their expectations for the future. Economists closely monitor the mood of the consumer because their spending accounts for about 70 percent of economic activity. Well, consumers do not appear to be shopping at Target right now. The discount retailer is coming off a weak holiday season, and it said the 2017 does not look much better at this point. Profits plunged in the most recent quarter, and the company now expects full-year profits to come in well below estimates as well. That sent Target shares tumbling down more than 12 percent today. And now, as Courtney Reagan reports for us, the company is planning on doing something dramatic to get those shoppers back. Target's holiday quarter missed the bullseye, and the retailer doesn't expect a turnaround this year. In fact, the opposite. The discounter is reversing course, now forecasting comparable sales and profit to fall. Target laid out its three-year strategy, though it looks a lot like what it and other retailers have already been doing. We think we've got the right plan in place. CEO Brian Cornell and other executives detailed Target's plan to invest $7 billion to improve its online operations and delivery, remodel 600 stores, build 100 more small format stores in more populated cities, introduce new brands, and take a hit to margins in order to lower prices. More than a year ago, though, competitor Walmart began remodeling its stores, invest billions in its online operations, and lower prices. And it's paid off in the form of higher sales for Walmart, perhaps in part at Target's expense. This last year, we remodeled 25 stores. Well, we've got 1,800. Over the next few years, we'll take that learning to over 600 stores. And as we reimagine these stores, we know how the guest reacts. It drives more traffic. It brings our guests back more often. It builds greater engagement. Well, we've got to do that at scale. Now it's going to take some time. Target still leans heavily on its network of stores because while e-commerce is a growth spot, it's still only 5% of total sales. Target says both online and in-store are still priorities. And while many are skeptical of the three-year plan, Target CEO says he still has the support of the board. The board's been incredibly supportive. 
Obviously, we spent a lot of time with the board prior to today, but I can tell you universally, they support the plan because they know it's the right thing long-term for the company, it's the right thing for the brand, and it's the right thing for our shareholders. Although shareholders felt differently today as Target stock price plunged in reaction. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan in New York City. So with Target's turnaround plan looking a lot like what others in the industry are doing, is this a race to the bottom for retail? Some answers perhaps now from Joe Feldman. He's senior retail analyst at Telsey Advisory Group. Good to see you again, Joe. Welcome back. Nice to see you. Thank you. The uh, CEO says the right plan is in place, but as Courtney pointed out, cutting prices is already being done by a number of Target's competitors. Is that the correct strategy for them, do you think? Well, I think they need to cut prices to stay competitive um, and just to keep that gap with those other competitors that are closing, shutting, uh, reducing prices. For example, Walmart announced yesterday that they were going to be reducing prices in like tw 1,200 stores in the Midwest. Kroger's been reducing prices. I mean, there, there's a lot of pressure. Others are leading this on the price was down. And, you know, Target just has to keep up. And that's really part of the pressure for them. Mr. Cornell pointed out that the board is on board, mm. if you will, with this three-year plan they have in place to turn things around. But clearly Wall Street is not. Stock down 12% today. What do you mm. think Wall Street wants to see Target do? Well, I think Wall Street wants to see some proof in the pudding. You know, they've had other strategies in place. Some have worked. You know, they've talked about signature categories, core areas like home and apparel, and they've done better there. But there wasn't much discussion of grocery today. During the Q&A at the analyst day, they talked about grocery a little bit, but that's like 35, 40 percent of the store. And, you know, there wasn't much answer there as to what's going on. And I think that Wall Street wants to hear and see more proof that some of these strategies are going to pay off. And we need to, time to see that happen. But, you know, as of today, people don't want to give them that time. And the visibility for the next couple of years is still pretty limited. The company pointed out a 34 percent online sales growth uh, metric, yep. which they say validates their performance uh, or that model of their performance. But they're going up against the likes of an Amazon. Yeah, and look, their growth is very strong right now, and it is off a smaller base, uh, So, but they've been capturing a little more share. Then you kind of wonder, but are they taking some share that they would have otherwise gotten in the store? Mm -hmm. uh, they need to have both, as do most retailers, and they are closer to the consumer than most retailers, given 1,800 stores or so. But I feel like they're sort of sandwiched a little bit between Amazon and Walmart. And they have a decent overlap with both customer bases on the higher and the lower end of their, you know, customer spectrum. And that's created a lot of pressure for them. And, and that's really where Target sits right now. And I think they're trying to find ways to differentiate to drive that, that customer, the core customer, back in the store and to spend more. All right. We will be following the story. Joe, thank you very much. Thank Joe you. Feldman with Telsey Advisory Group. Target is not the only company cutting prices to lure consumers, as we just talked about. So are discount brokers. Fidelity now, the latest to lower its fees as competition in that industry intensifies. That sends shares of publicly traded discount brokers like TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, and Charles Schwab sharply lower today. But what's bad news for their business may be good news for their customers. Dominic Chu has more on the fight over fees. The war to win your investing business just got even more heated. So what does that raging price war mean for everyday investors? When the average price comes down, I think the retail investor benefits. Uh, you know, we don't believe there'll be any degradation of services, you know, at this point. Uh, so we think, yeah, the, the winner here has been the retail investor. Uh, or, over the e-brokers at this point. Fidelity views the move as a way to aggressively bring new customers to the company's ranks, attract clients of other brokerages, and keep the ones it already has. In a statement, Fidelity's president of retail brokerage, Ram Subramaniam, said, quote, with these unprecedented price cuts, Fidelity is continuing to transform the brokerage industry, bringing the best value to retail clients. Our active trader clients who make hundreds of trades each year will particularly benefit from our dramatic price reductions, and all clients who trade will be able to keep more money in their pockets. More money in the pockets of investors means potentially better returns and more profits to retire on down the line. But as investors benefit, the brokerage industry will feel the pain. Obviously, pricing commission cuts are going to negatively impact you know, the, the 
revenue and the earnings of the e-brokers now. It depends on, one, how much revenue they have uh, coming from commissions, and it varies among Schwab, E-Trade, and Ameritrade. Uh, Schwab having the least dependency on commissions, Ameritrade having, having the most. The cost for investing for everyday Americans has always been a hot topic among those in the financial industry and regulators as well. Over the past decade plus, costs and fees for things like trading commissions and fund management have been falling, making investing more accessible to more people. Now the big question for the industry is how it adapts to continued pricing pressure. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Still ahead, why the corporate nerve center of a global electronics powerhouse is in crisis management mode. Chances are you own a Samsung product. It's a big company, maybe a TV or a tablet. Well, the South Korean conglomerate is now embroiled in a corruption scandal after a number of its executives, including its billionaire heir, were indicted. Pauline Chu reports tonight from Singapore. The South Korean special prosecutor formally indicted Samsung's head, J.Y. Lee, on charges of bribery and embezzlement. Four other Samsung executives have also been indicted. The question is whether $38 million in Samsung donations to charities were actually bribes for government backing of a Samsung merger in 2015. The charities were run by Choi Song Sil, who is President Park Geun Hye's longtime friend and advisor. Prosecutors allege the donations curried favor with the president. So how did Samsung Group shares do? Well, investors didn't seem phased as Samsung Electronics, the crown jewel of the group, rose 1%. A battery company, Samsung SDI and Samsung Engineering also gained. Samsung also confirmed the former vice chairman, Choi Gi Sung, and the president, Chang Chung Ki, have both resigned. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Pauline Chu in Singapore. Valiant predicts a tough year ahead, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The drug maker predicts 2017 will be a year of transition. The company expects revenue to fall as it continues to adjust to a changing business model. Valiant also cited headwinds from drug pricing pressures and fewer prescriptions. Shares plunged almost 14 percent to 1438. Shares of Signet Jewelers took a hit following a Washington Post report alleging years of systemic sexual harassment at a subsidiary. The report was based on class action arbitration filings. The jeweler responded by saying the class action did not involve sexual harassment, only gender discrimination claims regarding pay and promotion. Shares fell 12 percent to 63.59. Kite Pharma's experimental cancer drug hit its main goal during a study. The drug uses a new type of treatment to attack tumors. The company is optimistic that treatment will win government approval. This data is actually about six to seven times better than anything that has been described so far for these patients. Mm -hmm. This is not a 20 percent increase or 40 percent increase. This is significantly. So therefore, we believe that if that will hold, uh, we will see an approval by the end of the year. Shares popped more than 24 percent to $70.77. 3D printer maker 3D Systems swung to a profit in its latest quarter. That topped estimates. Revenue did rise, but not at the clip that analysts had been expecting as weaker sales of professional printers and on-demand services hurt results. Shares were down 10 percent today to close at $15.20. And Palo Alto Network said that execution challenges in the latest quarter caused revenue to rise less than expected. The cybersecurity firm also reported a wider than expected loss. Shares there initially fell in after hours trading tonight and it finished the regular session down 1 percent to $151.90. The CEO of Tenet Healthcare says that delays in changes to Obamacare will actually help the hospital operator during an earnings conference call. The CEO said that the idea of repeal and repair is a positive for his company. Tenet reported weak quarterly revenue, by the way, and that may have caused shares to slump by 14 percent to $19.30. 
And it's not just investors who will be paying close attention to what the president says tonight, but also small business owners. And that's because the big changes coming to the Affordable Care Act could impact the way that they do their business. Kate Rogers has our story. Hi, Mike. How are you? Mike Roach's business, Paloma Clothing in Portland, Oregon, doesn't have to offer employees benefits like health insurance. The company of just 15 is too small to be forced to comply with the employer mandate of the 2010 Affordable Care Act. That mandate requires firms with at least 50 or more full-time employees to offer coverage or be hit with a fine for failing to comply. Even though Roach didn't have to offer insurance, he realized the benefit of doing so back in 2007. And once the Affordable Care Act came into law, he was given an added bonus. When the Affordable Care Act passed, it included a federal income tax credit uh, that was quite generous towards small businesses that provided health care for our employees. It, it was uh, almost $5,000 in 2010, uh, and it ramped up a little bit each year, and last year it was almost $8,000. We used that to basically pay down the actual cost of our employees' health insurance. While Roach no longer qualifies for the credit, he's decided to continue offering coverage, recognizing it's a competitive advantage for his business. But in a health insurance marketplace that stands to be impacted in a big way with President Trump's promises to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, many like Roach are wondering what the future holds. Dirk Bach said he'd like to return to the days of having a say in the benefits he offers for his nearly 200 workers. I would like to see the mandates dropped on there. Uh, before, it was something that, you know, as a company, you have a choice. You know, if what you want to offer your employees and the type of benefits, and people have the choice as to where they want to work. But some young entrepreneurs like Christian Berkey benefited from Obamacare policies, including a provision allowing individuals to remain on their parents' plans until age 26, enabling him to launch his sustainable men's clothing startup. I just got off my parents' health care. I just turned 26. So that was something that was very helpful for me. Um, and as we look as a business at being able to support our employees, I think, you know, that's something we're very conscious of. No matter what side of the policy debate entrepreneurs find themselves on, Main Street will be listening carefully tonight and looking for any clues as to how they stand to be impacted by the Trump administration's changes to the health care law. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers. Coming up, hitting the gas, the cars that dominate the list of best vehicles and the one big American brand that was left out. And here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. More retailers report their earnings, including Best Buy, Lowe's, and Dollar Tree. The Fed releases its beige book, an anecdotal look at the nation's economy, and automakers will release their sales numbers for February. And that's what to watch for on Wednesday. Speaking of automakers, the annual issue of Consumer Reports rating the best and worst vehicles shows foreign automakers continue to outpace domestic brands. In fact, just two American auto companies are ranked in the top 10 this year. Phil LeBeau has the ratings and why this report is especially bad news for one of the big three. With Americans buying cars and trucks at a record pace, almost every automaker is cashing in. But according to Consumer Reports, which tests almost every new model and also asks subscribers to rate their own cars and trucks, some automakers are doing a better job than others. This year, the top four brands are Audi, Porsche, BMW, and Lexus, with Audi repeating as number one for a second straight year. Some of these brands, I mean, they just make unbelievable cars in terms of the way they perform. They drive very nice. They offer a, a lot of luxury, quietness, but also performance. Where are the American autos? Well, Tesla has the highest ranking at number eight, right ahead of Buick at number 10. GM was also the only American automaker to have two models, the Chevy Cruze and Impala, singled out by Consumer Reports as the best of the best. On the other hand, Jeep, along with Dodge and Fiat, are cited as three of the worst auto brands in part because Consumer Reports does not recommend a single Fiat Chrysler model. The automaker says, we respect Consumer Reports' opinion, as they're one of many third-party evaluators we receive comments from. 
At the same time, we continue to encourage customers to experience our vehicles for themselves. People want to be in a Jeep, and they do offer something that's, that's a little bit non-tangible that, uh, that, that people do enjoy, and, and that's okay. Um, but as time goes on and more of these people drive these later products and they have the reliability problems and they realize they don't drive very well, it's going to hurt them. But so far, Jeep has not been hurt by Consumer Reports' criticism. In fact, over the last several years, Jeep sales have far outpaced the rest of the industry. Proof the brand and its SUVs are still attracting Americans, even as others give it a poor report card. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. The highest rated U.S. automaker, Tesla. Yes. That is unbelievable. It's unbelievable, right? Crazy. That'll do it for us tonight on Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Ferreira. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas, it's capital, it's businesses, the people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow, it's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.